started right now because we believe in starting on time. Hello, everyone. We are so grateful, so happy uh, right now to have you all. Just want to acknowledge that today is September 11th, um, which is a deeply meaningful uh, time in our country's history. I was in New York then. Just want to honor everything that means. And what's how we take that forward to make the country that we want and need. So it's a meaningful day to be having this conversation. We're going to go right into slides. You can share in the chat your name, where you're from, and anything you want to share about the debate last night um, that's the, your favorite thing or your favorite meme. Uh, we're going to have some fun with this. And also, for those of you who are here right on time, it's not too late to invite people. You can just send them the Zoom while we're getting started and be like, oh, come, you can join this call. And we had over a thousand people RSVP for this call. So it's going to be pretty incredible. And yes, we're recording and donation volunteer information coming soon. If you just can't wait to, to, to roll up your sleeves and dive in. So about last night. Wow, it was amazing. I'm honestly just so relieved and happy and just I just had the sense of like gratitude of just wanting to thank everyone on our team and all of you that we're at this point right now. Um, and just on top of every other reason, it just reminded me like in a personal way, you know, on top of all the like political reasons and policy reasons, just like, man, do I want my 11 year old daughter to like, and, and my seven year old son to grow up with such a brilliant, strong role model, woman president. Um, so I'm feeling better after last night and zooming out. I think we should think of this as halftime in the game. We're halfway between July 21st when Kamala entered the race and November 5th election day. So we're in the locker room. The first half has gone pretty well. Um, and we're still basically tied within the margin of error. And we know as great as the debate went last night, people's attention span is like 30 seconds. So a few weeks from now, when most people are actually start to vote, the debate will be ancient history. And our job in the second half of the game is to close the freaking deal. So let's get back out there. Um, and I want to, let's see, are, we, are these slides coming up? Are people seeing slides? Yep. Oh, okay. I just can't see the slides. All right. Good, good, good. So um, I'm confusing myself here. All right. So look at this visualization um, of where we're at. This is from Maurice Mitchell from Working Families, who is many of you remember was on a previous call and said this beautifully simple thing. Many of you saw this in the Bat Signal 4. You already know this. If you haven't read Bat Signal 4, please you know, go read it, share it. Um, three buckets of winning, strong campaign check, super PACs funded check. The only one part that's uh, not close to funded is the independent ground game. And that's what MVP's amazing partners do, which you'll hear much more about on this call today. And our partners, they might be a bunch of groups you've never heard of in states where you don't live, but their scale is actually much bigger than the campaign. So as you can see, we still have enormous gaps to fill in order to for them to run their full scale voter contact problem programs. Um, and so just to back up, welcome new people. Any of you are new, if you don't already know MVP, uh, you can look at the MVP movement.vote website. We'll tell you everything you need to know. Basically, we're here to help you move your money to the best lo local organizations in all the key winnable races in the battleground states for president, Senate, House, down ballot. And we're in this to win in the next eight weeks. And we're in this for the long term because that's how we win, for real. So the overall need in the field when we surveyed our partners is conservatively at least two to 300 million because there are other groups that that we didn't even survey that are adjacent to us that aren't even counted in that number. So we have an ambitious stretch goal at MVP to move 
a hundred million dollars. And so far to date, this cycle, we've moved, it says uh, 55 million. We moved 60 million actually, as of this week in political C4 and PAC funds. Remember, this is not counting, this is only counting political C4 and PAC funds. We're not talking about any other types of money. So this was a good week, $5 million that we are in the process of getting up to the field right now. Thank you. Thank you for all of you who are part of that. And historically, September is our biggest month and groups are relying on late money. Obviously, early money is much better, but they never get enough early money. So they are relying on this late money that we are moving now. And so the number one thing we can do right now is fund the ground game. And we're going to try to turn that into a hashtag fund the ground game that, that you can help us amplify. And here's a link we'll put in the chat. And if you think, wow, that's a lot of money that's still needed. What's my little contribution going to do? Or I've already done what I can do. That's why we are building a movement and inviting you to join us in building a movement of donors. Individually, we're all just drops in the ocean. But when we come together and organize with others with us, we can create a gigantic blue wave and win everything this fall. So the presidency, the Senate, the House, and picking up seats down ballot to position ourselves to really and truly create a better country. There's so many ways to get involved. And I want to really shout out our incredible volunteer team. We have 55 Zoom events and house parties in September alone happening. Huge thank you to everyone who's organized them, hosted, co-hosted, come to these parties, and welcome to all of our new people who've come in through these house parties. So we're hoping to do as least, at least as many parties in October. And all you have to do is sign up to co-host an event and invite your friends. We make it really easy for you. You can sign up right there on the volunteer page. And over time, just to talk big picture for a second, like I said, we really take seriously this vision of building a movement of donors and donor organizer volunteers. We have four strong established volunteer hubs. We have a great donor organizer team that's supporting people to build local MVP teams all over the country now. It's super exciting. We have donor organizing. Uh, you're going to hear about it basically right after this call, just stay on. Uh, we have office hours. They've already, the volunteer team has already raised over 10 million of that 60 million in partisan money and a real long-term dream. Yeah, that's amazing. You can give it up for the volunteer team. And this is, uh, our, our real dream is to scale up this movement of donors organizing donors. If we could build hubs all over the country like we have in these four places, you know, I think we could raise twice as much money, which gets us a lot closer to what we need, what the field actually needs to really transform this country. So that's the big vision that we are inviting you to be part of in whatever way feels right for you. And look, we even have brand new lawn signs and bumper stickers in our new merch store. We've already had over a thousand orders for lawn signs and bumper stickers, and they're popping up all over the country. People are seeing them and sending us photos. And it helps people feel like they're part of a movement, part of something larger than ourselves. So because um, with the MVP, we're not just another organization trying to say, donate to our organization. You know, we really believe we have to build a movement together all over the country that we're all just like deeply feel connected to and proud to be part of. So that's the bigger vision. And how and how do we keep donors and volunteers involved in the long term? Because like all these groups you're going to hear on the call, they're doing incredible work. They're all terrified for 2025 that money is going to fall off a cliff, you know? So we have to be committed long term beyond this election, whatever happens, that it's usually, you know, 10 to 15 years to really transform a state. So that is the level of commitment we need to get the results that we want. And uh, that is a really good segue for the topic of our day, which is deeper organizing. Um, so we're going to talk about three forms of innovative, deeper organizing and voter engagement that, that some of our partners are doing. Um, deep canvassing, which many of you have heard of, relational organizing, which many of you have heard of, and micro-local organizing, I like to call uh, organize your block. Um, so you know, so much of the voter contact that is happening 
uh, that's not our partners is very like fast and superficial and anonymous and transactional. And, you know, getting to like big scales of numbers, but quality, the quality of those interactions matters. Like I cannot, I'm so annoyed by all these annoying text messages I'm getting, you know, that are, you know, making so many people turned off by the texts and emails. And what we're funding and what we believe in is actually deep relational things where you're happy, you actually, it actually fills you up instead of drains you. So that's, that's what we're um, invested in. And, you know, if you think about traditional organizing, it was always very localized. I grew up in Chicago and I can remember walking precincts with people who literally knew everyone in their precinct and all their stories of their families and they'd have these long conversations that were as much social as political. And at the end of the day, scaling that is, is what we really need to, to achieve the level of organizing that we want. So I'm excited to introduce and bring on Demario Cooper, brilliant co-ED of CPD Action, Center for Popular Democracy Action, to share the really incredibly innovative work that they're piloting um, and piloting in, in um, partnership with their local partners. CPDA is a national in intermediary, sort of like MVP that focuses on supporting and aggregating the power of local organizations. And I actually, it's it's fun to be here with Mario because we actually met when he was a student organizer at, sure. in Ohio in 2004. Yeah. And yeah. he literally later ran the biggest organization in Ohio, Ohio Stand Up that that's MVP's major partner there. And um, and then he is going to give some context and then pass it to his colleague, Steve Paul, um, who is doing the model on the ground in a little state you might have heard about called Pennsylvania. So, Demario. Yo, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Billy. It is true. It's always funny that like I knew you when I didn't have gray hair at all. And uh, I had like long dreads. It's literally like 20 something years we've known each other. And I like to tell people a lot of times, like Billy was one of the first people that I had met in my radical student organizing days who was like, you probably should pay attention to elections. You know, and it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things, you know, if you've been a young student activist, you're like, yo, down with the system. But then someone shows up and says, look, you know, actually, we have a system that allows us to interact with it in particular ways, and you might want to interact with it. And and that kind of led me on a journey around, like, how do we get regular folks, grassroots folks involved in organizing and building power for their communities? And so the work that I've been doing over the last 15, 20 years has really been about, like, folks who have been really considered as, like, throwaway people actually being able to have enough power to be influencers in the decision-making process. And so CPD, an organization that I am currently a co-ED with, with Anna Lilia Mejia, um, some of you may know, and actually I'm seeing a lot of names that know both of us on this call. Uh, we run an organization which is 51 affiliates in 35 states, DC and Puerto Rico. And the organization's primary goal is to build a world where everyone can thrive by actually engaging community to build power. So. Part of our work, when you think about what we're doing on the C3 side, is about long-term base building. We're looking at the current moment, and if you saw it at the base yesterday, it's looking good for folks who believe that human beings are human beings, right? Like, and you and all human beings should deserve the ability to thrive. And you know, and and yesterday was really a good example of like what we can do when we work together and when we have representation that reflects the community. Um. So our work really is about, you know, when we think about right now building power, there's a couple of things that we've been experimenting with. And CPD was created in 2012 out of a bunch of organizations that were trying to figure out how to be lower, larger than the, the size of the pieces, right? Like how do you, how you reach economies of scale when we think about building social movements? And another thing around, like when we think about social movements, we say a lot of times movements raise issues they actually bring issues to the surface that may have been like underlying, 
but movements don't actually see justice. You have to build institutions and infrastructure if you want to see justice because of our, our opponents and those who we are against are building structures and institutions that allow them to continue pushing their agenda past any individual moment. And so when we think about uh, CPD, I want you to be thinking about we're institution builders. Uh, currently, we have 51 affiliates on the ground. A lot of the affiliates that I, a lot of the, the groups that I saw, whether that's BMI or 1PA or Lucha, these are groups that are all also affiliated with the Center for Popular Democracy. This year, the, in, in, uh, Anna Lily and I, I should say, we arrived almost three years ago. And when we arrived, we wanted to center the, the, the work of base building. Right, like this thing that we talk about, and people like to see the outcomes of policies, but people don't actually want to see the understand what's happening in the background in order for those things to happen. For instance, when people look at Georgia, they say, "Oh, Georgia flipped uh, in the last election." You know, Georgia flipped, and we got a Senator Warnock. You know, um, but no one talks about the seven to eight years that New Georgia Project was building on the ground and talking to people on the ground and using every election cycle to continue to build base in order for that moment to happen. And so when you think about CPD, think about we are the thing that's underneath that, like NGP is a part of our uh, a part of our affiliation, BMI is a part of our affiliation, OOC is a part of our affiliation, but we're a thing underneath it that is helping affiliates and organizations build the power that makes every door knock more efficient. And so um, door knock, phone call, text more efficient and thinking about a long term strategy for us to actually build power in strategic locations that allow us to have like really move policy over the long term. When we look at like the next five years, let's say 2030, there are places in the country that are going to flip demographically. There's an electorate that is rising. We want to use this current moment in order to build the infrastructure that allows us to take advantage of that. So when we think about elections, it's like you're building these huge sandcastles. And we saw this in Obama, like the sandcastle gets washed away when the election's over. Like literally the office packs up, the canvassers are gone. The, the vendors have moved on to the next thing. And it's like over. And so what we're trying to do this year is build rebar inside of those sandcastles that can capture as much of that energy as possible. And when you hear some of the people who are talking, they're thinking about that long-term vision. This year, there's a couple of things we created. One, we created something called the Louise Jefferson Initiative, which is a map. I mean, it's not Wheezy Jefferson. I know everyone thinks that that's what it is, but it's actually... The Louise Jefferson Initiative is named after Louise Jefferson, who was a, one of the first Black cartographers in the country. She was helping develop the Green Book, which is a route to freedom that Black people use when they had to travel back and forth from North to South to visit their families. But this map is identifying high potential voters. We say high potential, meaning like these voters are the margin of victory. Currently, there are about 20 million people who don't participate in elections at all. Right. And, and a lot of the campaigns that we hear is only talking to folks who are on the list, who are registered voters, thinking that they have to persuade people to be left or right. But actually, there's a persuasion universe that is an in and out persuasion universe. And the idea of engaging those folks first around issues that matter and then keeping that engagement through in past election seasons to return to move them into actual voters. So we grow voter. We grow we grow institutions. We maintain institutions. But those institutions actually are about growing voter and increasing the electorate in a way that helps us win the things we want. So we created a map that like literally drills down to the precinct of the neighborhood and shows you who are the high potential voters. But that is not the only thing because those exist. You can go to the van and get that. The thing about this map that is different is that you can overlay <laughs> new data sets. So when you think about um, you can overlay new data sets. So when you think about climate disaster zones, you can overlay that, that data set and go have a conversation with the person who lives there that's more direct around the issue that they'll be facing in the next set of years. Or for instance, what, we, what we've done as a network is we looked at, uh, we did a listening campaign and it came back from the network on the ground, people at 1PA, people in Lucha, people in Ohio, came back and said that housing was a critical issue. Now, I'm not going to say you're hearing a lot about housing because some group like 
CPD, for instance, had did a listening campaign, built the campaign, did a poll to show that housing is a critical issue for renters, right? <laughs> and then started like moving that messaging. And now it's reflecting back from candidates that housing is a big issue. But that is kind of what happened. And so we've been building that work over the last, you know, two years. And at this point, we know that rent and housing is an issue that people are not hearing enough about from electeds. But it's also an issue that will move people from even being conservative ideologically to being more aligned with us and willing to vote and move around housing issues. So we've been building that we rent revote base um, and building a base of tenants who are interested in, you know, that we're using to turn out. And then overlaying, again, I'm looking at the chat, like overlaying climate, like you can have a conversation with someone who lives in a flood zone, right? Who are buying a, who's buying a house in a flood zone. And go to them and say, this house, you know, Ms. Johnson, this house is never going to stop flooding. And this is why. And we need investments into infrastructure in order to help you do these things. Or to start thinking about what you're going to do with your family. So if you could think, this map lets us drill down into locations and, and actually have targeted conversations with folks on the doors through the affiliates. The other thing that we've been building is a guardians program, which is really about, like, actually engaging people now in the work of like participating in this election, but actually having those folks set up to be in these little pods. So the Guardians program is about taking the, the 100 neighbors around you and, and taking responsibility for engaging them. One of the ways that we're doing it is partner with our with, with partners uh, WFP to give people like a ability to take a selfie and then mail that selfie as a mailer, like as a pressure mailer to the people who live around them. And 1P is one of the groups that are working, is working on that. You'll hear more about that from, uh, from Steve later. But what we really want to communicate is right now, it seems like chaos, but there is a lot of opportunity in this chaos. And if we want to do more than just win this election, especially considering you can get rid of Donald Trump, but Trumpism is something deeper and looking at the people on this call, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, 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 and we actually can do something now to turn the corner and actually build infrastructure that pushes us towards not just this election, but the midterm. And then thinking about what's happening in the census and redistricting and how we can have power in certain locations that allow us to influence how redistricting happens. And so we implore you and CPD, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off the soapbox, but I do wanna communicate that like, we have to be thinking about how we use this moment to build base that allows us to build more power. Paulo Ferrer said, our job is to do today, to make actions today that make possible tomorrow more than what's possible today. And that's the work that we're up to. So thank you, Billy. Appreciate you allowing us to have a second to speak. And it's really great to meet a lot of the folks on this call. I'll put our information in the chat or, or Billy can, and, and we can follow up if you're interested. Cool. And do you want to pass? And I'll pass it. Yes. And I'm going to pass it to uh, Steve Paul, who is actually one of the, is in the state of Pennsylvania and is actually one of the smartest EDs and has been rebuilding and building 1PA in a way that allows it to actually take advantage of this moment and moments in the future. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to pass it over to you. Cool. Uh, thank you, Demario. Uh, first of all, I just want to also say thank you to Billy and the MVP team um, for the continued support that we've been getting from you all um, since I became ED almost uh, three years now. Um, and then <clears throat> I also want to just take this opportunity to thank everyone for being here on this call. I know we're like here to talk about November, uh, what's ahead for November at this point. It also must feel like, a, um, I don't know how about, how y'all feel, but like an emotional roller coaster. Things have been going, <laughs> and my emotions have been going sideways, up and down, you know, every day. Uh, same thing for my team. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to kind of reflect on why this moment is so significant for both me personally and obviously for all of us, right? Like, because, you know, <clears throat> I think what I'll be talking about a little bit today, like everyone's clear <clears throat> that this year's significant. We have to put everything on the line. And, you know, my charge to you all, we're asking you all to do the same, um, to, 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 to do the same and fund the work, not just for November, but be in this fight with us for the long term, because that's what it's going to take, right? And so I'm filled to call, I'm, I feel called to talk about like the significance of this moment. And the Mario kind of started to put this um, into context, right? Like, the, the way I look at this election is always in, you know, it's not just a date on a calendar. It is a long-term thing that has long-term consequences. So, you know, my story is like, I 
was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, in 1985. And the the reason that, like, you know, for me in this moment, in this election cycle, that's become real and I've, you know, like had to like process that is like in 1985, uh a person won the election in, 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 in Haiti and decided to call himself president for life. And so when I think about the moment with Trump is like, if I win this election, I'm going to be a dictator, right? Like that's Trump's dream. Um, you know, that becomes real for me. And I think about the consequences because like truth be told, my entire life was shaped that moment, the moment I was born. Um, and that person became a dictator, right? From a very early age, I guess, you could say I was clear about the consequences, not just elections, but like the moments that follow. And I was clear that elections wasn't just a date on the calendar, but it was like a, a thing that had real lasting continued consequences. Um, and then of course, the second time I think an election had a, a major consequence in, in, in my life was in 1991, because, you know, because from 1985 to 91, people were on the ground. So it was mass protesting. There was resistance on the ground that created an opportunity for us to finally elect and get democracy back into Haiti and our country. Um, but unfortunately, then President Bush, you know, because he didn't like our president for a lot of reasons, overthrew that democratically elected um, election with the military leaders in, in Haiti. And the years that follow, obviously, you know, my parents, escaping death squads and seeing things that no seven-year-old should ever have to experience. Um, but the, the the other election that actually, you know, had a real, real impact in my life was Bush, the father, losing to Bill Clinton in his re-election bid. Because, because Clinton, and I, I, I always imagine in that moment, people were in the 90s making phone calls, doing postcards, doing the same thing we're doing here now that allow President Bill Clinton to actually win that election and restoring democracy back to Haiti, obviously with some bad trade-offs um, that had real consequences for the country. But like, I would not be here today had President Bill Clinton hadn't lost that election, right? Bush was clear that he was not gonna get involved. And so when I, when I say over 35, 7, 37 years of my life, like elections time, time again, having real consequences, long-term life and death consequences, not just for us here, but globally, I speak from experience. And so for me, the way I look at this work in this moment, this critical year is like, I know the work we're doing is critical because not it's not just for this moment, right? Like we're playing for the long game and we're playing for future generations. And so um, I just wanted to kind of frame that in that way. Um, Cause I, I think it's important for us to start looking at um, these kind of, you know, November or whatever as like moments in a longer strategy as opposed to like the NRBR. Um, and I think that's the unique approach we take on like, you know, other programs or vendors or even a campaign, right? Who are, we're just uniquely positioned to think long-term. Whereas like, I feel like other folks are like coming to people's doors, talking about, you know, hey, I need you to vote for this candidate and then they're moving out. But we are, we are clear that we need to be thinking about this as a long-term strategy. And so, you know, at 1PA, we're a Black-led multiracial organization that is fully focused on building Black political power in the state. We do engage voters, right, like um, who, as DeMario explained earlier, is like who, are, who have been systematically excluded or, or who vendors in a party see as people who typically don't, like, actually engage with the power structures in this country. And so they are excluded from the political process. And so that is our target audience. Our goal, and I would say our unique contribution is like, we're able to get people from a point where they understand what the power of government can do for them. And more importantly, how they can be a part of that process. And so, you know, I'll be clear like that. It's not a, that, that work we do is not a quick fix. It's a multi-year process. And so, you know, I'm encouraged by some of the support we've been getting this year. And, you know, as Billy mentioned, um, and, I just want you all to join us in that fight long term. Um, you know, we're not just, I, you know, I'll talk about the, some of the programs we and the plans we have, but like the last thing I say is like for us, we're not just here talking to folks about candidates only and 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 the folks that are gonna save them, but we're like literally showing them how the government can have tangible impact on their lives, their loved ones, their kids, their schools. And I'm I I've seen that work. And I've seen how powerful that can be to move people to action as opposed to the other way around. And so, 
yes, like everyone else, we have a bold plan. Everyone knows it's high stake. Uh, we're knocking over 800,000 doors. We have 200 canvases we're going to put out in the field. We're making 1.5 million phone calls. But I would say two things that our, our, our programs approach in the state. One, in addition to asking for your vote, we are building a relationship with you. And so everyone we talk to receives a text message and an email. And then with CPD's help with their national phone banking team, we are calling those folks and then moving them to weekly orientation, membership meeting, actions, et cetera, right? And so we want to keep people actively engaged beyond the election. Um, so these spaces create sort of like deeper relationship opportunities. The second approach is um, the Guardians program, like Demario started to talk about. Um, that is like literally at the center of our strategy um, this year. And, you know, you know, folks have been talking about survey, the margins are going to be much closer than they were in 2020, right? Like, so if it comes down to 10, 20, 30, 40,000 votes, like obviously every vote counts, right? And so, you know, in addition to this massive field program that we're doing with other partners in the state, we think the Guardians program is going to be the difference maker. And so we plan to recruit 150 community members who are talking to 100 of their neighbors, building lasting relationships with their neighbors, talking about deep issues that they share and moving them to action, right? So it's like political education, um, deep relationship building, and those neighbors are going to be moving together to action. Um, I'll give you an example of how that could look in, on, on the ground. So in, in our West Philadelphia um, Guardians program, for example, right, like our Guardians are in sort of like a um, co-governance um, relationship with their local city council person. So going to council people, fixing vacant lots, um, making that a community space with the folks that were like engaged, like the hundred neighbors around the Guardians um, turf is a different approach to say, look, your council person that you elect is the person that like actually has a big impact on fixing this vacant lot, on your public schools, on this, on that. Let's talk about Project 2025, right? Like, let's talk about you getting to taking that next level of engagement versus like, you know, just vote for this person for this one reason, right? Like it's a it's a different level of engagement. And we know like people are more likely to show up to the polls when the person talking to them is their family member, is their uncle, their granny. And so there's sort of that social aspect, um, that social pressure aspect that we put on in. And we think the Guardians program is a powerful tool to do that long term. Um, so those 150 people are our Guardians program. The second kind of layer of that is our election captains program. And so those people, um, were, they're taking that a step further. They are, in addition to talking to their neighbors, they are going to be the people that are going to be at the polling locations on election day. They're going to be doing the drag, like last minute, hmm, I didn't see Miss Linda show up to the polls yet. Let me give her a call. Um, they're also going to be the people, uh, this is really important, the few days leading up to election, anyone that has any issues with their ballot that need to be cured, because fortunately in Philly and Pittsburgh, a huge percentage of people for like really terrible reasons, have had issues with their ballots because of signature, et cetera. Those folks are going to be the ones we mobilize to go get those people to come vote provisionally, et cetera. And so those are 210 precinct captains across the state that um, we are going to be recruiting. So far, we have 195 um, election captains signed up, um, which is pretty amazing. I think, you know, with more funding, we are looking to actually double that number. We think we can cover more neighborhoods with our um, election captains and more polling locations. We have about 147 um, voter guardians sign up, um, 75 of them in Philly alone. And so we think we can also double that and cover more. Um, we can give we can cut more lists and cover more turf if we had more funding. And so, yeah, I'll I'll stop there. Just, you know, like for us, we know like it's about right, like. Trump might go, we will win, I will say, will win in November, but mega isn't going anywhere. And so building that long-term organizing infrastructure to be able to react to whatever comes after November is super critical. And we also think this is the way where we can continue to win elections long-term um, going forward. So yeah, stop there. Thank you, Steve. Um, and we're a little bit behind time, so I'm gonna go right to Christine. Um, who's been organizing with Bosa de la Frontera Action in Milwaukee, well, actually not just Milwaukee, all of Wisconsin. Um, Christine, do we have you with us? Christine's been telling me like scary stories about the Republicans are doing in Wisconsin. And they've had this Voceros um, 
relational program for a couple cycles. So um, do we have Christine? Christine, are you here? Could you come off mute if so? Okay. Um, and we're going to tee up Marta just in case uh, we can't find Christine for some reason. I know she Christine might be in transit. Um, okay. Let's go to Marta and Christine. If you can hear us, jump in at any moment. Marta, we're going to bring you in. Um, <laughs> Hello. So, I... Um, so Marta Papadiak has been running uh, with People's Action. It's the, you know, what, third probably cycle you guys have been doing deep canvassing and is going to talk about deep canvassing with slides and then pass it to her colleague, Ken Whitaker, who is doing it on the ground in uh, Michigan. We got a whole blue wall theme. Maybe we'll have to do Sunbelt next. <laughs> Love it. And I love that picture you found of me from the internet <laughs> of me canvassing. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Marta Popadiak. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I'm the director of movement governing here at People's Action and super grateful to Billy and the whole MVP crew for throwing down with us super hard. Um, I'm going to talk about deep canvassing as a persuasion tactic. And I want to first start with sharing a little bit about who I am and my skin in the game. Um, so my my father left Krakow, Poland um, in 1974 um, because he was afraid, he, because he was protesting Poland's authoritarian government. He was an inspector of the Communist Party. And in 1979, there was escalated violence and crackdowns and martial law, which forced my mom to come to Chicago. And both of my parents had family members that were killed and that forced them to make the, dif uh, the difficult choice to leave their homelands. And so I'm really holding my family's story close to my heart um, in this election. And it's really animating my urgency in this political moment and the urgency that I feel for us to win in November. Um, so People's Action, we're a collective of grassroots power building organizations. We are in 30 states and our power build, uh, our political and power building program this year have two core objectives, defeat Trump and the rise of authoritarianism at the ballot box and also build long-term permanent infrastructure. We're using this election cycle to build community power so that our organizations are stronger and ready to further the fight against authoritarianism in the US. So we're keeping our eye firmly on this election and we're holding sight of our long-term goal of winning governing power. Um, we believe that we have to organize for the long haul as folks from CPD were saying as well because of the significant ground that we've lost to the right over several decades. Because in 2020, we defeated Trump, but we didn't defeat Trumpism. And so this year we are planning to bring in 55,000 new folks into our organizations and train 75,000 leaders inside of our political program so that we can be more ready for the fights ahead. So this year, um, People's Action with our partners in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, and Michigan are going to talk to 450,000 conflicted voters and persuade them to vote for Kamala Harris. And we're going to organize a base of volunteers to use the most effective persuasion tool, which is called deep canvassing. Um, it's a conversation structure that shifts a person's underlying beliefs to change how people think and behave in a very lasting way. So our strategy to win in 2024, if you go to slide two, um, so at People's Action, we believe that persuasion is a core part of any strategy to win elections. Persuasion is also very difficult, especially in political campaigns, but we need it to win elections. And so that is part of the role that People's Action is playing this year. So I mentioned that deep canvas is the most effective persuasion tactic. Um, I'm excited that we get to use it because we're using it in the most important battleground state. Oh. Hello. Um, so since 2015, um, we've been doing an extensive series of randomized control trials, which are experiments um, that are conducted by independent political 
scientists, and we've been running them rig rigorously to measure the impact of deep canvassing. Um, so what I'll say is that it's the most proven and durable way to persuade voters on issues. And we've been testing the effect of that for candidates as well. So persuading in deep canvas, it, we persuade at a magnitude that is rare. Most efforts to persuade have little or no effect, but in contrast, deep canvas conversations have been found to be able to create the equivalent of a decade's worth of social change in one conversation, or to successfully change minds in a presidential race with anywhere from 17 to 102 times the power of the average persuasion effort. So that's a lot of words and numbers to say that going deep with people um, has a lasting effect, um, a longer effect than traditional canvassing. Um, it's been found to shift voters' attitudes towards outgroups, towards people on the other side. Um, and so I wanna share, how do we do that? On this slide here, slide three is um, traditional versus deep canvas. So um, in a traditional canvas, you get an ID, who you're gonna vote for. Um, we train, yes, no, or maybe, okay, thank you, bye. We train canvassers how to use a script. They deliver a message. But in a deep canvas, we use a one to 10 scale to surface the complexity of people's thoughts towards a candidate. We train canvassers to listen deeply and to ask questions. And we also train canvassers and volunteers to exchange vulnerable stories so that we can build rapport and trust. On the next slide are a series of core questions that we use to develop the script, um, which is about understanding what is the core conflict um, inside of a particular person. What are the underlying beliefs and values that we are trying to shift? Um, and what is the emotion underneath that particular conflict? And we use stories as a tool to get deeper with people on that front. Um, and then on the next slide, um, it shows our, um, our script development process, which is very complex. So this is what we did in 2020. Um, it's a very collaborative and iterative, iterative process. In 2020, it took three months six states, nine organizations, a ton of people. We went through 27 versions of the script. Right now we are currently in the iteration process for the um, Trump versus Harris script. And in addition to these logos here, if you refresh, cause my scripts, I messaged you, but um, I did a little editing down. <laughs> um, but you'll see that we also are working um, in Air with Arizona, uh, with Lucha in Arizona on script. This is script. Uh, slide five, sorry, um, with Lucha in, in Arizona and also plan in Nevada. Um, so in 2020, if you go to, oh, see, you have different numbers. <laughs> you don't know what, that's a different number. But uh, in 2020, um, we ran a massive deep canvas persuasion program to defeat Trump. And we were able to contribute to the margin of victory for President Biden. Uh, in um, let's see, in 2020, we did over 200,000 deep canvas conversations and made a significant impact um, towards the margin of victory. Um, and we found that conversations with voters are the most effective persuasion mode in a presidential election, and that deep canvassing is one of the most promising forms of canvas based political persuasion. So if you go to the next slide, there's a fun graph. Well, this is Rolling Stone um, in 2020 talking about how effective that is. I'm happy to share all of this. Um, but basically what all of these numbers mean is that for every 100 people we spoke with, we identified an additional three Biden supporters who were previously undecided. So we are talking to folks who will otherwise not be focused on by the presidential campaign. Okay, so I've said it a million times, Deep Canvas is the most effective persuasion tactic. We're using it in the most important battleground states. Um, I saw a poll the other day that showed that undecided and conflicted voters are hovering at about 18%. And so having 450,000 Deep Canvas um, Persuasion conversations are 
um, are going to make a really big impact in this election. We are doing this in Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Um, and so we really would love y'all's support um, with additional funding. Fully funded, we'll be able to get to 450,000 conversations. Um, and so we would appreciate all y'all's support. And then also, if you go on the next slide, there is um, a link for y'all to sign up. Um, we are hosting phone banks uh, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And we would love for y'all to support and throw down with your voices and also with your dollars. So thank you so much. I wanna pass it to Ken Whitaker, who is my homie from Michigan United Action, who's gonna talk about how Deep Canvas looks on the ground in Michigan. Hey, homie, thank you, Marta. Um, everybody, as Marta said, my name is Ken Whitaker. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and handsome. You can call me handsome anytime you want. Uh, and I'm the executive director of Michigan United Action, formerly Michigan People's Campaign. Um, before coming to Michigan United Action, I worked in the Michigan House of Representatives as a legislative assistant. I've worked on the management teams of several local, state, federal campaigns in multiple states. And uh, for four years, I actually managed our movement politics fellowship here at Michigan United Action, where we canvass low propensity voters in Detroit and several downriver communities in 2016. And we've since expanded throughout the state. Um, I heard uh, you say that we've you know, done deep canvas for like three cycles, but it's actually been more than that because we did deep canvas in 2016, 18, 2020, which Marta just talked about as well as 22. And now we're doing it again in 2024. Um, when you find something that works, what do you do? You do it again. So in 2016, our fellowship helped flip a house district from red to blue. And honestly, it's the only house district in the entire state of Michigan to do so. And we did it by electing uh, a, a care candidate um, to the state house. We did this through what we call deep canvassing. And Marta did a very good job of talking about what deep canvas is. Um, where the average conversation ranges anywhere from between like eight and 15 minutes. And I know Rob in the chat asked about how do you keep people on doors that long? You know, but we keep people on doors that long because we connect to we connect with them um, with with emotionally significant stories. Um, it worked so well that we got enough Trump voters to split their tickets and vote for Darren and flip that district. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit more about that. And before I jump in, I want to tell you just a little bit more you know, uh, about myself, um, because this is about building relationships. And that's what we do on the doors with Deep, Deep Canvas. And Rob, this is also partly how we keep people on the doors. I came to Michigan United Action, not just as a leader and an activist and a volunteer, but as a story. My life crisscrossed the lines of every campaign that I found at Michigan United Action. I was devastated by the petty loan debt trap industry. I lost my childhood home to foreclosure on a predatory loan that was serviced by a former congressman, Dave Trott, um, who actually used the proceeds that he got from foreclosing people to run for office. And by the way, fast forward, deep canvas and direct action actually got him out of office. Um, I've had friends and family members deported. My wife and I, um, we've raised a child with special needs and continue to while battling our own ailments, all the while caring for my 100-year-old grandmother, who's about to turn 101 in two, in two weeks, um, who doesn't qualify for assistance with elder care because her fixed income is too big, but can't pay for a home care worker because her fixed income is too little. So I found a power in my voice at Michigan United Action, and I've learned to turn my private shames into public outrage and public outrage into a movement with purpose. And it's in my self-interest to be a conduit for others to be able to do the same thing. And it's that type of energy that we bring with our canvassers to doors. You know, we, we talked about a uh, little bit about conventional canvassing. This is when, you know, people go to the door with a script to deliver a message and tell voters what to think. It normally ranges in between, between 30 and 60 seconds. And I know everybody on this call has been canvassed uh, conventionally. And you don't actually remember those conversations you had. You, you, people come to your door, they hand you some literature to tell you what to think, and then you get them on off your door, or you don't answer the door at all. And that's a big problem because civic engagement 
are at historic lows in communities that we that we service and we organize. Turnout, apathy, it's all it's all evident at the doors because we've relied on tactics that generate small or short-term impacts. And lately there's been no impact at all in the most impacted communities. We don't even like how we respond to the, I mean, how we respond to conventional canvassing. So why would we even expect someone who's not as engaged as you and I to respond well? Um, we've got numerous policy fights that, that are in stalemates from affordable health care to immigration, program funding, um, tax reform, pipeline, Supreme Court deregulation. I could go on and on and on, but we fail to change the underlying drivers behind the declines in turnout and support, such as prejudice, disempowerment, apathy, and feelings of helplessness to the power of this oppressive system. So de-canvassing is a candid two-way conversation where we ask voters to share their own relevant, emotionally significant experiences and reflect on them out loud. These conversations are like flash wonder ones. This is about building a relationship on the door. They're centered around relationship building. Now our canvassers are able to do this by doing four things, and that's creating a non-judgmental space for a voter to talk at their, at their door. We make voters feel comfortable stating their views. If voters aren't asked to share their views, they won't acknowledge their real feelings. And if they won't acknowledge their real feelings, there's no way we're going to move them. Um, DeMario talked about people, you know, moving people in and moving people out. You know, um, this is what we're doing with the canvas, moving people in. And we're able to layer a lot of the work that we're doing, as well as like the postcards for working family party. We give people um, small things to move forward with, but we also listen actively. We use body language that's inviting. We lean in, you know, we say, hmm. Okay, we ask follow-up questions about voters' experience that gets details. You know, Rob, if I asked you, could you tell me a little bit more about your experiences? You're going to talk because you don't have a canvas that actually gives a dang about what you're going through. We're not there to deliver a message. We're literally there to learn about you. Can you tell me, you know, why that's important to you? Or how has this issue affected you and your family? Or, you know, one of the golden questions that we ask is, how did that make you feel? Because when we get people to reflect out loud on how they feel and what they're experiencing, the movement happens on its own. We don't have to tell them how to feel. Our canvassers are taught to model vulnerability. So our canvassers often share their own stories, like the one I just shared, to make voters feel more comfortable sharing theirs. This isn't a requirement, and nor is it the main ingredient of a deep canvas, but the primary purpose is to build a rapport with the voter and make them feel comfortable describing their own experiences. And it builds a safe space in a conversation for voters to remember, share, and reflect on their own stories out loud. Now, I talked about House District 23 earlier. What happened in House District 23 wasn't a fluke. It was planned, there was a strategy, and it was executed, and it worked. And as I said, when something works, what do you do? You do it again. And when it's about a movement, you share it. And that's what we've been doing across the country. Um, working with People's Action, now we have seven states that are running deep canvas so that we can reach these 450,000 conversations. Um, this is on the doors and on phones. Here in Michigan, we've now brought on 40 deep canvassers um, to deep canvas in Macomb County and historically segregated um, swing county that a lot of uh, um, party uh, apparatuses won't touch because party apparatuses are looking for, oh, we know you're going to vote our way to, we just need to turn you out. We just need to mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. But we believe that power is built over time and people are moved over time. And that's what we do with our deep canvas. Um, so Thank 18, you so much, Ken. I, I think we have to transition back to Billy. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, oh, this is so powerful. Um, and we're going to uh, just hear quickly from Christine uh, before we close out about relational organizing in Wisconsin. 
Thank you so much. And please uh, give me a friendly prompt at two to three minutes. Um, first of all, thank you to Movement Voter Project. You all have been critical to our success here in Wisconsin since 2018 uh, and obviously across the country. And thank you for the opportunity to share what's happening on the field. Uh, Voces de la Frontera Action, which is the C4 arm of Voces de la Frontera, um, is a statewide member-led organization in Wisconsin. And our focus has been on organizing the Latino vote and uh, the multiracial youth vote. Um, this is a critical voting block uh, that's been necessary uh, as part of a winning coalition, um, is, especially since 2018, and relational organizing is at the heart of it. Um, what is relational organizing? Relational organizing is organizing through your uh, personal social network. So obviously your family, your friends, people you know. Um, and for the Latino community, this is particularly effective. It is the largest growing voting uh, population and voting block in the last 30 years. Huge demographic in terms of like young people starting you know, of age. Um, and it's definitely a long-term strategy as well as to how Wisconsin can become a solid progressive state. Um, you know, what's happening right now on the ground um, is that the GOP has been very aggressive about um, trying to win the Latino vote while at the same time you have someone like Trump coming just yesterday to say at a rally to his base um, that he was going to uh, make sure that there are mass deportations and they're going to be bloody ones. Uh, and so that's what we're up against and what we have to defeat. Um, just to give you, and I'll, I'll maybe just close on this because I feel like we're running out, you know, because of the time frame. but to maybe just illustrate the power of relational organizing, um, Israel Pena is one of our members in um, in 2021, he was wrongly terminated from his job because he participated in a statewide general strike um, called The Day Without Latinos and Immigrants. He and his coworkers, uh, the company uh, said that he was the one that was the organizer. He was kicked out. We fought to get him reinstated. Um, and um, a year later, though, a dangerous machine that he was working on was, again, a basis to uh, wrongfully terminate him. But because he had been involved with the Essential Worker Rights Network, he knew that, um, as we learned, that uh, under the Biden-Harris administration, there's a new protection for workers whose rights have been violated that grants a deferred action status, similar to DACA, um, that protects you from deportation and allows you to move forward with a labor violation, uh, filing that with a government agency and participating. He was the first one. Uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, he did that and was able to secure uh, not just the rights on his job for him and his coworkers, then at a second company. So now 150 workers have been able to adjust their status and improve working conditions. Spanish language training with uh, where there otherwise was none for a Spanish speaking majority workforce and, uh, and, and safer uh, conditions. And this has been, so now Israel who when he became a part of Voces, also joined the Essential Worker Rights Network. In 2022, for the governor's race, then 2023, he got 30 of his nieces and nephews, right, young Latinos, first-time voters, to organize, turn out to vote. Um, and that was just in 48 hours. And now we have 150 workers and their families, many of mixed immigration status families, who are also turning out to defend the gains that we've achieved under the current administration and to advance long-term the fight for immigration reform and obviously the state fight for driver's licenses with new fair maps in Wisconsin. Um, our network is now 23,000 voters, two thirds are new and infrequent and we're seeking to grow that um, to 27,000, reconnect and grow. We do need help because money came late to Wisconsin, unfortunately. Um, so the scale up is fast and, and we appreciate your support to make sure that we deliver uh, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and all of you who are working your hearts out and your teams who are, are working, doing everything you can to save your states and our democracy. We are with you and just want to invite everyone on this call to just take a moment and think about something that you heard today that you're going to take with you. And we're all just incredibly lucky to be able to hear directly from these very busy frontline organizers and leaders. And um, and it's our ability and responsibility to share their stories with as we go through the world. 
um, and share this. So I'm going to actually bring in my colleague, um, Regina Clemente, who runs our donor organizing program as we transition. And because what you're going to hear next, if you can stay, is from some of our incredible volunteer organizers who are doing the other side of the coin from the organizers on the ground. You're organizing your communities, and that's how we're going to get this done. Um, so just deep, deep gratitude to um, to everyone, to Demario, to Steve, to Christine, to Marta, and um, to Ken. Like, thank you for your incredible work on behalf of all of us. And we're going to keep sending you money. And yeah. um, and that's a we meaning the big we, because we're all going to have to do this together. Um, there's no... Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. It's just all of us together talking to people, introducing them to these incredible organizations that most people have never heard of that are the true heroes in saving our democracy. So thank you everyone. And I'm the call, the official call is over and we're now gonna start our, our MVP organizing office hours um, for any of you who wanna stay and sit in on it. And it's gonna be, um, much more interactive. Um, so we invite people to, to ask questions, to troubleshoot, like, I have an idea. I have some people. I'm trying to figure it out. We're here. That's the kind of conversation we're going to have. So thank you, everyone. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it to my amazing colleague, Regina Clemente. Hey, all. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Regina, longtime MVP team member um, who has the honor of working with our donor organizing team and volunteers. And as you all probably already very clearly know, we take organizing very seriously here, which is why in addition um, to donor advising, we have a team and a growing cadre of volunteers focusing on supporting communities to organize their own communities um, of donors. Because just like our groups are the best messengers on the ground with voters, y'all are absolutely the best messengers with new potential donors and bringing folks in who care about these issues. And so currently we have, as you saw in Billy's presentation, four amazing volunteer-led hubs throughout the country. We have one in the Bay Area, Seattle, Eastern Mass, and Western Mass. And we have emerging what we call hublets throughout the country from Atlanta to New York, to Rhode Island, to Chicago, to LA. Um, and it only takes a few people to get these hubs started and build them into serious powerhouses. Um, and they tend to create some really awesome expanded social circles in a time when I think uh, we can all use a little bit more nourishing community. Um, and together this year, uh, you heard a bit before, we have raised millions of partisan dollars um, through over 250 volunteer events. And we've brought in more than 9,000 new donors to MVP through this volunteer donor organizing work. Um, and so thank you to all on the call right now who have been a massive part of making that happen um, through so many different ways. And the field still ne needs millions of more, right, uh, to be able to pull this off and ensure that we save democracy this year and win a uh, federal trifecta. And the reality is it's also our job to really help a larger group of donors understand that election day is not the finish line, unfortunately, especially this year when our groups will be the ones doing the work around election defense and organizing to protect whatever the results are. So we're going to be fundraising right up through the election and beyond. Um, and the more folks we engage now, the powerful we'll be for the long term. So really appreciate all of you uh, staying on to hear about this part of the work. Right now, there's a few really concrete ways to plug in. House parties have been our most successful tactic, both virtual and in person. Uh, and we're looking for more hosts and co-hosts to invite your networks to a one hour briefing of MVP's work. We now have a very easy way to do this, and that's by signing up for a community event as a co-host, where your job will be to reach out to your network and get them to the call we've already scheduled and arranged. Um, all of the details will be taken care of ahead of time. We have multiple calls scheduled in September and October um, that we'll post specific dates on in the chat. Um, and this is the moment that hundreds of thousands of people are now looking to do something as Michelle Obama called on us to. And we're seeing folks step up to give and volunteer who haven't engaged yet to date. And so it's a great way to reach out to your network, plug them into an already existing call with a great uh, MVP staff and volunteer team leading it. Of course, if you wanna host your own 
house party, remote or virtual, or in person or virtual, we can absolutely support that too. You can buddy up with people you know, set your own time and date and get support from staff and veteran volunteers. And we're just asking that teams that do their own house parties right now aim to raise a minimum of $10,000 for these events that do require more staff and volunteer support. Um, so that's a general goal. And um, if you want to do this, but you just don't want to do it around a certain date, we can also set you up with personal fundraising donation pages. And that's, you'll get your own landing page for folks to give with your message about why you're encouraging folks to give to grassroots organizing through MVP. Um, and the final thing is, if you just don't want to be in front of the scenes at all, we also need a lot of help behind the scenes putting on these parties and running Zoom and doing party coordinating. So that is always another volunteer option. Um, so before I introduce some of our awesome volunteer leaders, do any new folks have any burning questions about any of this that we've already said? Feel free to jump in now. We're always excited uh, for all new folks thinking about helping organize donors. And wait, Regina, so all people have to do is be willing to forward an email yeah, yes, it can be as simple as just forwarding an email. Um, we'll set up your personal party page. You forward an email either to your personal party page or about the community party. Um, and uh, you get many more folks involved who often just do not know this is a way to impact the election and impact long-term power building. And there's links in the chat about how you can sign up to do that. So let's jump to our awesome volunteers who are on today. Um, welcome Pam, Becky, and Diane um, from all over the country. To start, can each of you tell us a little bit about your background and what moved you to become a volunteer donor organizer with MVP specifically? And uh, we'll start with Pam over in Atlanta and then go to Becky and Diane. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Sugarman from Atlanta, Georgia, and thrilled to be here. I got involved with MVP because my childhood friend, Janet Levine Naherney, has been a supporter for many, many election cycles and a very hardworking, uh, successful volunteer. She uh, does her work in Boston and came to Atlanta to uh, help us host local parties back in the spring and the summer. And since then, what has happened is that we have taken folks who have participated before and become a hublet. So we meet every Tuesday to check in with our uh, folks in Atlanta who are interested in either hosting a party themselves or supporting or contributing or um, sort of working into the system. Uh, and um, that's how I got here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pam. Becky. Hi, all of you. And let's see, there's 153 of us on this call. That is so great. Know that we are just a handful of hundreds of people like us that have been um, supported and trained and stretched by Movement Voter Project staff to do this stuff. I'm calling from Olympia, Washington. I got involved because I had learned about grassroots organizing in the abstract way. Uh, in, in from history books in college and then just my own lived experience could begin to to witness some of the great gains that have been made in our lifetimes just two dramatic examples the farm worker movement and the civil rights of lgbtq communities and uh when i heard about mvp i was just Ill oh and then i had a brief opportunity for about eight years to work with people, veterans from the American Civil Rights Movement, and was just so deeply moved by their courage and their bead on strategic organizing for power. So when Movement Voter Project emerged, it seemed like such a fantastic no-brainer to try to build power both through elections and long-term grassroots organizing. That's how I got involved. I've been a devoted volunteer since 2018 and helped found the Washington State Hub. Yeah, you did. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> Diane. Thanks, Regina. Hi, I'm in Oakland, California. So I'm part of the Bay Area hub. And I retired somewhat, retired somewhat recently from um, being a health educator as part of a program at UC Berkeley around workplace health and safety called the Labor Occupational Health Program. 
where we did a lot of work with uh, labor unions, worker centers, with a special focus on my end on young people, making sure they know their rights on the job and can really have a voice in the workplace. So this ties in really nicely with MVP. However, when I finished working, I really thought what I want to do, health and safety is really important, but I really think I need to work on climate change. That, that's the thing that I should be doing. It became clear to me that we're not going to get anywhere with the kind of quick policy level, or fast, maybe not quick, but faster policy level changes we need if we don't have the right people as our elected officials. And so, again, through some nudging from a close friend, uh, Margaret Bird here in California, um, she kind of worked on me. And in the last um, year or so, I've been very involved. And again, this MVP just really speaks to, to my heart in terms of really um, helping us create new young leaders, really leading us into this multiracial democracy that we need. And it also is just effective. So it speaks to my, my logical mind as well. Um, so I'm very excited to have been involved for the last maybe 15, 16 months. Thanks so much, Diane. And can you all say a little bit about why you think co-hosting a house party, joining a community party, doing a personal fundraising page right now is an awesome way to get involved. How's it been for you guys? Sure. Uh, I didn't say before that the reason that I support MVP is because uh, because it's so strategic and because of the relational organizing. So my history working in um, politics and in organizations uh, and with civil rights leaders as well leads me to know that um, and, and working with Janet leads me to know that um, since the election will be decided by so few people in so few places that what we were hearing about before, deep organizing or any organizing that's about peers uh, talking to one another just makes perfect sense to me. It's because um, in my own work, I believe that we are going to reweave our democracy two people at a time and one conversation at a time. And so the fact that the organizers are doing that with their peers and that I get to do it with my peers when I invite them to be part of NVP, we have conversations about what's going on in the world and what we care about. And um, then by uh, coming together in a really easy way, supported by staff and by volunteers, volunteers to ask our friends both to learn about what's happening in the election and to um, be together in our own relationships. We're reweaving democracy too. I love it. I love it. <clears throat> um, I'm a new grandma, y'all, as of a week ago, and I'm even sleep deprived to prove it. And um, what a potent time for all of us on this call. And um, it really comes to the fore when you're in the rotation to be with a little vulnerable baby at 3 a.m. in the morning while the parents are sleeping a little bit. And um, thank God this beautiful, healthy child has been born into a family that's been, um, had the privilege to be financially stable, well-educated, good jobs. And I just, think of all the tens of thousands of people who are holding little babies at the same time I am around the country and um, and who might not be in a financially stable family who might have so many obstacles thrown in their way in terms of ethnicity, class, um, immigration status, uh, orienta sexual orientation. Um, uh, maybe their homes are going to be flooded or burned from climate change. So, um, you know, you just you, Movement Voter Project and fundraising for Movement Voter Project and, and organizing my own peers has been a way to channel all those fears, all those heartaches. One of my colleagues, you, Rob Beam, if you're on this phone call, he says um, for him, um, MVP has been Prozac for progressives. <laughs> and, um, and to do this year round and to do it DIY. We're getting trained by MVP staff and we're getting trained by each other to get better and better at this. And um, one tiny example, um, we in Washington heard about what you amazing people in San Francisco did with a dance for democracy that broadened the number of people that we got to educate. 
one of those, so many people from that thing have gone on to do their own parties, including we're having a fundraiser next week. You're all invited. Um, one volunteer got her 96 year old mother to have a phone fundraiser next week for her birthday party. An amazing woman. So the, just the ripple effects that we, let's see, we're still a huge number of people on this call. And the, the potential for us to ripple out and organize we donors to do this work that you've been hearing about is just so exciting. Thank you, Becky. Diane. Yeah, I mean, I have to echo all of that. I feel like I feel like we're doing a service for the people that we're fundraising from, which a year ago, I, I'm sure I said, I'll do anything. In fact, Margaret's probably in the other room saying, you said you didn't want to fundraise. <laughs> so, but but it ends up feeling like you're really helping people find a way. I mean, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's blue, blue, blue out here. And so doing local get out the vote work is, doesn't, isn't really going to have a big impact on the national um, political scheme. And there are so many people that are terrified about what's happening. And so they're very excited to learn about MVP and not only that it might stave off the, the, the biggest disaster that we're, we're all worrying about, but there, every, so much is happening up and down ballot that it's making such a difference in so many uh, different places. And, um, you know, it, it, it is what makes people feel excited. So, and that it's building, as I said earlier, this, this multi-racial democracy for the future and that the speakers on the call earlier today really um, hammered in so, so much more articulately than I'm speaking right now. Um, so our group, our little group, I mean, it's, it's growing and growing a lot in the last month or so, but really kind of 15-ish people over the last 15 months together, we've been able to raise, I think, like a million and a half dollars through, I wrote down some numbers, like something around 40 in-person house parties, a few Zoom parties, the the Dance for Democracy and some other fun events like that, but primarily the in-person house parties. And, and people are, they're just so happy when they leave those house parties. So we're, it's felt good to us and it's felt good to the, to everybody that we're working with. Thank you all. So you've seen it. These, these are the faces of our ground troops who are democratizing giving to grassroots organizing and educating so many folks that there are things to give to that make huge differences both for elections and for the long term. And so lots of you are still here, which we're so excited about. And we're just going to open it up to any and all questions. Doesn't matter how small or big questions, comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, love to hear if you're excited to join in. Oh my God, wait, the Bay Area crew, they're all having a party. <laughs> they're all in the same place. That's nice. That beautiful. <laughs> Yay, it, Bay Area. find deep, deep joy in political organizing these days. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell from these groups and these faces, but there is some deep joy and camaraderie in this space and um, all benefiting us winning. Uh, well, I raised my hand, so I don't know if- uh, oh, Perfect, uh, thank you. Hey, Sarah. Hi, hey there. Hey, Billy. Uh, nice to see you. Known Hi. Billy. Oh I don't God. know. If I didn't know you when you were born, but I'm going to say I sort of knew you from the beginning. And for those who haven't had that pleasure, you know, just this work has just gotten uh, better and better. I mean, I just want to say I, I have a kind of some cha personal challenges right now, or just not necessarily challenges. They're just things that are, but I want to, so, but I do want to connect <clears throat> up. I just thought I'd put it out there with other people who live in the Los Angeles area and uh, talk about what we do. We do. I think it's. I, I was kind of a little appalled. I went on a and I'd like. Please push back if you if you can. I I was. I got on part of a call for. Focus for democracy and, um, you know, I think that, uh, and I and I was just kind of horrified by the, number amount of money. I was sort of amazed by the money they were raising, but I also was intrigued that. Uh, that they don't list the organizations that they're involved with on their website, which seems sort of weird because I just like the way you, you all handle that because we want to know, it's personal, we want to know uh, who are actually involved and who we're talking to. <clears throat> and um, I think that's what's important what MVP does 
is, you know, yeah, you've got some absolute proof and proof of what you do, but uh, and how effective it is. But it really is is that win or lose, there's something more on the ground when the elections are over, and uh, that's great. Um, and um, anyway, I just want to just wave hands that I see some I see I'm seeing Catherine right there, or I've seen your picture. And uh, I saw Amy and Susan and Shauna. And anyway, if I can, if any of you want to take the lead, I'd be happy to, to help you out with the house party here in LA. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, thank, you. thank you, Sarah. And we got to shout out, Sarah's one of the original, like, people who like created this whole field of, of funding progressive grassroots organizing back in the day. It's so fun to see you. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions? Folks who want to get involved and tell us where you are so we can- Bridget, a great you. question in the chat that I think Zoe is going to answer. Um, I can read the question Good or Zoe. Question. Great. Um, Josh Jacobs asks, hi, everybody. This is Rebecca. Um, how would you articulate to MVP donors or co-hosts the transition point this fall, after which funds raised for MVP will not impact the election directly, but instead start to feed into post-election important activities? Um, Zoe put a link in the chat, but Zoe, I don't know if you want to just give yeah. the answer. Maybe Regina, you can. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the truth is all this work we're doing right up to election day is real, real expensive. Um, and the groups we work with are going all out and taking risks to make sure that they can take their work to the scale needed for us to win on election day and all of the things we're working on. The reality is they still have bills after the election day that they need to cover post-election. So if a group is scaling up a canvas to be knocking on the doors until the polls close, they're paying for that the next month. And so part of this is making sure that our groups aren't left with huge bills post-election that they can't pay. We need to make sure we have their back and we're getting them the funds they need, even though it's after the election and it might feel like over for us. Um, the other thing is election day is not the finish line, never for MVP, never for the groups we're working with on the ground, and especially not this year. You know, now more than ever with threats of voter suppression, political violence, challenging of the election, election denialism. Um, our groups are going to be the ones on the ground doing whatever the outcomes are. Our groups are the ones doing the work needed, whether that's ballot curing, working to sure vote certification, um, organizing mass rallies to uphold election results. And so the, we will hopefully know a little bit from election day, but we're going to have a lot more to do and our groups are going to be the ones doing it. And so we need to keep fundraising for them beyond. Um, now, MVP does weekly money moving, grant making between now and the election. And so most money will be able to get to the groups before the election. But anything right before the election, um, we will be putting to very good use for those days after as we're figuring out every other piece of saving and upholding this democracy. Ooh, and Regina, one note on the weekly grant making. Weekly, we have grant making approval meetings. We actually are moving money out uh, every, almost daily in between those weekly meetings. So right up until election day, it's like we're just shoveling it out there. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? Oh, I see a hand, Jennifer. I cannot hear Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer, who turned 50. Happy birthday. Thank you. Okay, so I started asking this in the, uh, in, I'm going to put this up. It's not on my lap. Um, I, I started asking this in the chat, but I'll just articulate it here, which is that um, I forgot to, I didn't think about adding a fundraising element to my in-person birthday party. I'm not somebody who is a big money person. Um, my my idea of a splurge is like a hundred dollar donation is kind of big for me. Um, so I wasn't thinking of it that way, but I have done birthday, I, birthday fundraisers online in the past. Um, and I'm wondering, is there a form, is there some way that I can even post birthday use that as like, Hey, you missed my birthday. That's great. Uh, $5, 
$15, $50, $500 for MVP, but I, and I know that there's suppression of fundraising links on Facebook, on, on meta product uh, properties, but I'm thinking maybe, what do you think of this as a strategy? If I post a bunch of birthday photos, photos get upvoted in the algorithm. And it's like, this. it was a great birthday. And then by the way, contribute to Movement Voter Project. I'll send you a link later if you'd like to. Is there a, like a, a form, some kind of something that, because what I don't want people to do is send me cash. <laughs> Jennifer, right. I'd be so happy. I'm going to, I've got your notes here and I'm going to, I'm your organizer for New York. So I'm going to follow up with you on email. If anybody else wants to do this kind of thing, I'm going to put my email in the chat, but also like folks are in other places, but in any case, yes, the answer is yes. We can give you lots of good stuff to get you going on this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And then the last thing is like, I can't host in my apartment, but I do wonder what are the, what, if I, if I did want to either host or co-host an event, is there a way, do other people have space, but they're not personable? I don't mean, sorry. I didn't mean not personable. I mean like introverted and they don't want to be out in front. I, I don't have a problem being out in front. I just don't have the space. So first thing I say, like you and I will talk and we'll, I'm going to get you hooked into all kinds of good stuff in New York, but for anybody else who's kind of holding the same question, they're sort of like, Yes, but also different in different places, right? Obviously, if you're physically not close to any in-person parties, then it's hard for you to like get there or get people there. But we do have in-person parties happening in a lot of places. And we have these online parties that are happening like many nights a week at this point. Um, so there's like some big community ones that people can sign on to as hosts. And you can kind of pick a smaller role that's just inviting people, or you can go all the way up to a bigger role where you would like speak on the call. Um, and we'll work with you on that. Um, so this will be in some follow-up emails, but if anybody wants to start browsing that, I'm going to put some links in the chat and the donor organizing staff would be thrilled to work with you on it. I saw a hand, but I didn't see who it was. Free to just jump on in folks. Um, I see a question about kind of in-person versus um, Zoom house parties. And the reality is they're both great and there's pros and cons, right? In person, it's hard to be being in person with other human beings right now, especially if you can do it without getting COVID. Um, we are always fans of in-person organizing, of door-to-door -door in person canvassing, and it's going to limit who you can invite. And so the benefit of the virtual ones are you can invite everyone you know everywhere throughout the country or world to join and, and give to uh, all of this that we're working on right now. But we've had great success with both. Rebecca, this is Allison. Um, I want to say that we've had a couple of people sign up while we've been on this call today. We've come in through Airtable. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Our team will be talking to you very soon. Okay, we have about three more minutes left. Anything else from any of our veteran volunteers on the call or new folks interested in getting involved? I, this is Becky and I would just love to, I meant to share two uh, quotes that just always propel me. One is, um, I heard an organizer observe, ob observe this a year ago. He said, the arc of the moral universe bends toward whoever pulls the hardest. And that is the MVP supported groups. And that is us on this call. And the other is there was a, a book that came out right after the 2020 elections about grassroots organizing and the elections. It was called Power Concedes Nothing. And one of the editors said at a book talk about that book, you want to know who the most, who the least demoralized people are in the country? It's the organizers. They see a way forward. They just need the resources to do it. So go team. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yep. Least demoralized and also maybe getting the least amount of sleep other than folks who are dealing with very new babies. <laughs> so <laughs> any and all help we can get is hugely appreciated. It really is a wonderful way to reach out to people you know and in your networks and give them something just wonderful to contribute to. Um, and we are here and happy to support you in all steps of that. Okay. So, Billy, any final words? I no, so. just as we, I, I love that there are um, this many people who stayed on and many of you are, are longtime organizers with us and some of you are totally new and we just invite you to be part of this with us. You know, we're, we're building it together, you know, and figuring it out together and you, you might come up with the next dance for democracy that we all copy and, you know, it's um it's quite a cool group of people that that we're building here it's like i'm just so grateful we have like such an amazing staff we have such an amazing crew of volunteers who are like a second staff almost for mvp and we're you know we have this crazy dream and we're building toward it you know and wow now we have people in atlanta it's like <laughs> you know and and mm -hmm. i mean I, I think it's so cool the way that this has grown you know, often through friendships, you know, so like, like there are people who've gotten involved just because they saw a lawn sign. And they're like, what is this? And then they're like, I want to get involved. And there's some people who are like, oh, my best friend from college called me and now I'm involved. So I, I get excited when I think about the whole map, you know, and I'm like, who knows who, where, and if we could get, you know, Jan Seltzer's friend and who lives in Austin, Texas, and Jennifer Pos Posner's friend who lives in Austin, Texas together, oh, Yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe who knows what those two people, like it usually only takes a person or two to get one of these things started, you know, and like, I'm just, you know, my dream is that we would have 50 or a hundred like real strong hubs all over the country. And I feel like we are building toward that, you know, and, and um, yeah, so yeah. So uh, yay, this election coming up. Um, hopefully we will do all the things and um, and have a huge blue wave. And oh, Jennifer, were you raising your hand? I was. I just remember, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, mean, I just I just remembered one thing that I wanted to throw in as a tip from the, on the media side. Um, Disinformation, as we all know, is a huge problem. I don't want to belabor that. I think everybody understands why it is. Um, one thing that I'm seeing post-debate is, is an amplification of something that I keep seeing. I, I just finished writing a media literacy graphic novel. I'm very, inv I'm very invested in making sure that we don't unintentionally do the opposite of what will help us win, which is that, for example, all day today, I think we've all seen these memes of of it's so funny. We're making so many we're making so many jokes about the the immigrants eating pets meme, uh, a, a lie that Trump used in the debate that's been circulating in right wing media. When we make when we amplify through humor because we think we're debunking it by just being like, can you believe the jerky things that they're saying this time? We actually very often reinforce. The disinformation itself. Debunking is important um, and humor is important, but we need to use both of those things strategically and not amplify mis and disinformation. Super important. Thank you. And I, um, I see Sally, um, another longtime Washington State organizer with your hand up, and why don't we give you the last word? Yeah, it's just a quick thing that I heard from Tracy Abrams, Stacey Abrams, that I find um, it really speaks to me which is somebody who's asking her, so you're optimistic about the election? And she says, I'm not optimistic. I'm not pessimistic. I'm determined. And that has, I just think we're all motivated by that and that we can really make this happen. Yes. Yes. We are determined and we're determined together. Putting my hands in the middle, <laughs> like go team. <laughs> um, have a wonderful week and let's go organize and win and keep winning. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.